giant stalker, dragon stalker, crypt stalker, demon stalker, rift stalker, grown stalker, crypt stalker, scourge stalker, wind runner. I'm a pony, lead skill hunter. A death dealer, a life stealer. That's just the cost of being. Welcome to episode 146 of the Hunting Party Podcast. This is Euripides from Wow Insider, out DPS and call to auction. And I'm Dark Brew from thebrewhall.com and the Brew Hall on Twitter. And this is Frost Time from Warcraft Hunters Union, WoW Insider, and Frost Time WHU on Twitter. And I'm Molly Sonder from the Hunting Party Podcast. Yay. And today is Saturday, September the 29th, 2012. Anyone if you want to participate in the chat room but aren't registered, just go to the chat window and just type, oh, I don't know, welcome to Pandaria, and you'll be prompted to register. And speaking of the chat room, we are joined today in the live chat room by Ebelian314, Bella Sky, BM Jaeger, Shiami, Chuck Hunter, Edion, Elapide, Graviscore, Get the Grimble Hunter, Gobo, Greco, Alonzas, Havdor, Hotshot Gun, Jeffrey Nomer, Lelewin, Loranthus, Primok, Rhino Banya, Sayus, Slugslinger, Stone Tempest, Tagort, One, Warvinny, and a whole bunch of anonymous guests. And as always, your lovely moderator, Ollie Sonder. If you have any questions for us or topics you'd like us to discuss about Miss of Pandaria Huntering, please send them in a private message to Ollie Sonder, and she will rate your questions and decide which ones get asked and what order they get asked. Based on your answer to this question, what is the most awesome thing about leveling in Miss of Pandaria so far? It's also worth noting that our special, extra special guest today is supposed to be BRK. He is a little AWOL at the moment, but we're hoping he shows up a little bit into the podcast. Yes, and speaking of private messages, if you uh, if you did want to send a private message to somebody other than Alessandra, it does happen to be Banya's birthday. Just putting that out there. Huh. There you Happy go, birthday, Banya. <laughs> go ahead. I and might send have, a... It might have been yesterday. I, yeah, I, okay. Sure. Go ahead and send Banya a private spank then. <laughs> <laughs> and she's the one for those of you who don't know. And as in addition to being a guild member of ours, she did that Wow Biology One Hundred and One site, which looked at the real animals and wow animals and their counterparts. Mm. So uh, do you guys want to do uh, news and announcements? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess on the announcement front, we did, uh, shortly before Mr. Pandaria launched, we did the, the final WHU in-game event, um, which went a little bit off track, where we, we intended to go to the arena and do some, we had some neat little tests with... Uh, uh, glyph of explosive trap knockback stuff planned, but as we got there, um, a horde PvP guild found out we were coming and just started summoning people in left and right. So instead, we just hung out and killed them a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> now, were they ready for? How did the the traps work? Did the knockback traps? The, they, they did knock back, but we, we actually had this big orchestrated chain knockback thing planned, but we couldn't do it with you know a bunch of horde attacking us whenever we got near the arena. So instead, we just butchered them and each other a whole bunch. <laughs> that um, sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, then the plan for step two um, was we weren't going to do Orgrimmar because um, the guards were level 90 and the bosses got to 93, and we're like, oh, two, we should have done that before 5.0. Um, point one, but instead um, we decided we'd go to Razor Hill outside Orgrimmar, slaughter all of the guards in Razor Hill, and sort of taunt the board to come out, and we just have some PvP fun. Um, it didn't work really well, so, but we slaughtered all the guards and took over the town, and some horde came flying by and watched us, but none of them were willing to flag. Uh, so then, so we actually walked up to just outside Orgrimmar, and we're like, come on, guys, what's up? And horde started gathering, but none of them were willing to attack. And so we finally actually went inside Orgrimmar. <laughs> and so we kind of went inside to the courtyard, and then they came and attacked, and then we kind of butchered them, and the guards spawned, and we're like, hey, we're actually doing a lot better than we thought against the guards. And this was a smaller group. We only had like 150, 175 people. Because um, this was the... Like, yeah, this was a level... Yeah, this was level 85s at this point. So uh, we didn't have a huge number of people. We're like, wow, we're actually doing surprisingly well. Because the whole plan was this was supposed to be the suicide run at the end of the event. We're like, we'll charge in and suicide. And we're like, oh, well, we're all here and we killed everyone. I guess we'll keep going. <laughs> and so we charged into into Garage's room where we finally um, finally got butchered. But but in retrospect, we're like, you know, if we had just charged straight in and we hadn't sat there for like 
a half an hour trying to attract the horde to the city, we might have done it. <laughs> but uh, but that will we'll take care of that level 90. The nice thing is we were able to get, like I said, this wasn't a really big run. It was only like 150, 175. But we did get as many hordes as possible to show up. And we didn't crash any servers, so so that's I think a good sign for a future for a future event. Indeed. And um, uh, w- what about your race to level ninety? Oh yeah. my god! Yes, the race to level ninety. Yes, the midnight launch um, was obnoxious. The day of, you know, if you recall last week on the show, actually on the show, on the air, I called. Uh, GameStop to verify they were doing the midnight launch, and they said they were. Well, apparently, the day of the launch, they canceled it. Thank God a fan called them and found out and let me know. So I switched to Best Buy, went to the midnight launch, gave away some swag from from, from WoW Insider that WoW Insider got from Blizzard, which was awesome. Um, then on the way back, tire blew out on the highway, <laughs> pulled over, and I'm like, oh, God, no. I'm like, eh, 12.15, quick, quick, fastest tire change ever. Go out get maybe a few hundred feet, the spare blows out. And I'm like, God damn it. So I, call, I ended up calling, I think I went through three different towing, 24 hour, 24 hour towing companies. They're like, oh, we don't have any drivers on. Or they just had voicemail saying they had no drivers on. Before finally getting a tow truck driver and he comes and I start explaining to him how important about Mr. Pandaria and racing to level 90 and the server's open at 2 a.m. and uh, and so got the car dropped off somewhere and then he kindly offered to drive me home from there. Um, and so we actually got back in time and we got in and we had, um, a lot of fun, but very, very quickly we realized that it was going really slow. Um, we had a whole bunch of issues with the game and the starting quests and getting people going. But once we got going and we wasted some time wandering around, but once we got going, things were going pretty well and pretty um, pretty smoothly, and a whole bunch of people showed up, and we were all in vent, and we were having a good time. But yeah, by the time we had gone like six hours, I was like a bar or two away from 87. And, you know, at this point, most people, had, including myself, had been awake for well over 24 hours, and we were like, you know, doing the math, it'll be like at least another 10 hours or 9 hours to get to 90. And everybody was like, no, no. We're not staying up for another <laughs> nine hours. Um, and, you know, the plan was, because, like, the last two um, server, the last two server first had happened in, like, four, five, six hours. And so it's kind of what we were planning for. And obviously, um, the XP you get in the beta is wildly inflated, so it was hard to compare. So, yeah, and so, and sure enough, all of the all of the server first happened, you know, took, like, 15 to 20-something hours. So it was just wildly more than we expected, and everybody was like, nope, we're not getting up. So so we, we, we threw in the towel then, but I had a really good time. It was a lot of fun, actually. And especially, I especially liked when we decided, like, we're going to leave our farming zone and just wander around looking for rare spawns and killing everything on our path and, um, you know, wander around this world that no one else was in because everybody was in the starting zone. Um, so, I mean, it was a lot of fun. It was a good time, but nowhere near 90. And then, of course... The next two days, I literally wasn't able to log into WoW as I spent all my time um, compiling this uh, Hunter gear list. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that was the one thing that I noticed. <clears throat> well, we should probably go on to uh, segue into our, our, our impressions of Mr. Pandaria. I wasn't able to get on for the first couple of days because of real-life uh, work stuff. But once I finally did get on a couple of days ago, uh, it, it was surprising how slow this is going. I mean, like... If you're just questing and you're not doing five bands, it's just, it, you know, you sit down for like three hours and you do nothing but quests as quickly as, you know, reasonably possible. And you look up at your experience bar and you're like, you know, four, three or four bubbles in, you're like, what on earth? Like, I'm not even 86 yet on my Hunter. Yeah, it, it, like it I is said, slow. The people who were leveling really, really fast took them 20 hours. Um, and yeah, the- I did stuff for professions and I had to set up my UI and stuff like that, but. Still, it's, it, it was, I, I also feel like Blizzard made a deliberate choice to slow leveling. Um, which, well, I mean, it's interesting because it means that they, if you, if you level without doing five mans, it means that there is more content. Because by the time you get to the last quest that's not sort of a daily, you know, you're going to be level 90. But that means there's a lot of content to go through. Well, I, I, I don't think you'll clear all the quests um, before you get to, you know, before you get to level 90. So you're going to have zone quests and things that aren't daily is probably left over 
by the yeah. time you hit, you hit 90. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any shortage of quests. They just go on and on. But like I said, it is seems as a little bit painful and does feel very slow uh, and, to get from one level to the other. And to be fair, I have absolutely talked to a lot of hunters who like this. They're like, I think it's awesome that it's taking longer to level because I like questing. And of course, the bitter questing, leveling, hating <laughs> me. I'm like, you know what? They could have made it easy. And you still could have gone by back and done all the quests, damn it. You know what they should have done? They have to punish me. You know, because this, <laughs> this doesn't, it's not like, you know, giving me what I want would have taken what you want away from you. You could still do the quests. What they should do is uh, you should be allowed to uh, trade in a bunch of rep or maybe pay an extra $20 when you upgrade to just be, you know, <laughs> teleported to level 90 <laughs> after like six weeks. Like after every, like after, or like, you know, maybe once, you know, 25 people in your guild are level 90, then you can press a button and bang your level 90 and just skip all that. Or maybe pay a million gold or something. I don't, I don't, I don't, I have no idea how they would do it. But then again, I, I don't, obviously that'll never happen. This game is, is not, you know, we focus on the end game because that's where we spend all of our time for so long. But the reality is that most of the work that they do goes into, you know, the process of going from level to level. It's, uh, so it's, um, but no, there's absolutely tons of content there. I have run into a couple of quests that I was like, that was awesome. And actually, there was yeah. there was a quest I was doing where it was uh, something about following the whatever the king's son. Um, but like people were like telling like, oh, here's the story of what happened, and then you had to like live through and play through their story as they were telling it. And at first, I was I less imp- yeah, 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 okay. I'll let you At finish. first, I hated it because I'm like, this is such a waste of time. And I'm going, oh my god, another one. Oh my god, another one. I'm like, dude, I wish I had skipped these quests. This is a time suck. Until it was the dwarf. <laughs> the dwarf was there. It was like, and then a little raccoon named, named, named Gizmo came and, and he became my friend. Snap. Ah, what'd you do that for? I didn't even shine the light on it. And then another raccoon came and I named him Sock. <laughs> Yeah, when I was reading that, I could definitely see Fargo had written part of that. Yes, um, that, that was I was very. That was actually one of my favorite. Not the dwarf. I actually like the uh, the the sniper when the dwarf is sitting there trying to light up uh, the the village. You know, you have to sit there with a sniper and just click on things to kill them. And I'm like, wow, this this is actually kind of fun. Um, it was a very. It's a different kind of quest that you don't see very often, or I've never seen anything like it before in the game. And you know, the the game has sort of consistently impressed me. Uh, this expansion has consistently impressed me with the substance that they've put out. Um, you know, when I saw the, the 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 trailer, I was, as you remember, a little bit un- <laughs> underwhelmed. Um, but you know, it's it, even if even if the premise is a little bit weak in the sense that you know it just feels like a ten year old story idea that they just left mm-hmm. you know sort of dusty in a quarter until they needed it. Uh, the execution was very well done. This game is, it, this expansion is very slick, and I'm really, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm actually enjoying leveling. Yeah, it's very, very polished. I think the quests are well done, and they've gone well beyond just the typical, you know, kill 10 of these, gather 15 of these, and or they escort this guy here. You know? really <laughs> they started with it, I just sighed. But yeah, I also they, really appreciate when they have, like, you need to kill this big bad. But if other people are killing them, you get oh, yeah. as long as you participate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really nice move there. Yeah, that was another good yeah, one. I mean, you know, questing in these crowded zones, it's it still can be frustrating, but they seem to understand sort of like the good frustration versus the bad frustration. So instead of standing around and waiting for mobs to respawn, you know, you sometimes get overrun <laughs> and not necessarily killed, but, you know. <laughs> You have things pop up around you, and it might be hard to to get out of the area and move on to the next spot because you're just. That did happen to me once, where it was one of those like, "Wow, everything's spawning so fast! I just, I just need to leave and bring a pack of mobs with me and kill them away from the spawn area, Mm -hmm. um, just so I can can go turn in my quest." But that said, I I definitely am still on the other side from Euripides. I'm not enjoying leveling. I acknowledge (laughs) they did a really good job with a lot of it. I still am not enjoying leveling, and I'm particularly particularly now that we're not doing the the big group grind. Now that I'm just finally got back on on the game last night and got some some questing in, I was like, "Wow, this is just slow as shit!" Oh my god! <laughs> like I might just 
I might just, you know, hang up my hat and be like, I'm just going to wait until, until my guild's running some five man, so I'll join them a yeah. little that way. <laughs> it, just, just just real quick, I, I just heard from BRK, who unfortunately is stuck with a sick girlfriend and watching three kids. So Oh, no. So he's not anywhere that he can get onto a computer, but he said he'd love to come on next week. So All right. We can plan on that. And, right. he's, and he said, uh, tell everyone that you know, he gives his seal of approval for Beast Mastery, and if you're not using Blink Strike, you're sick in the head. <laughs> <laughs> he's right yeah. i i love blink strike i took i had stopped using it for pvp because i got just owned at level well, be, you know before the level cap was raised i was doing a lot of pvp and i was just getting owned by hunters who were using um uh sh- the other one the other alternative that every minute and a half you can do like uh, eight attacks in a row for a huge amount Link's, of damage links rush Links rush. That was it, and uh, that was just such overwhelming burst that I had to take it. But now that I'm just questing, and it doesn't really matter anymore. Blink strike is fun. It's like your pet just you know appears behind the guy and does yeah. like 100k damage. I'm like, well, that works. <laughs> and then, like one more attack, and the thing's dead. Yeah, right, blink strike. When you get to to combo that with uh, kill command. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those two together, blink strike is great. And the other one that I, I started toying around with was uh, thrill of the hunt. I took that just because it was passive, and I like that option too. I mean, that that's just procs a fair bit, and you're just doing a lot of arcane so I, shot spam, or if you've got AOE going on, you get yeah, the multi-shot see, I, spam too. I really like it for the multi-shot spam. Yeah, I was actually using that for PvP again before they raised the level cap simply because it was passive and I just didn't need another button to press. And also because, uh, you know, you're always moving, and uh, at the time they hadn't put uh, Aspects of the Fox back on the global or back off the global, so, you know, right. re- regening focus is just a pain. But with that up, at the time, you never needed to do anything but, you know, kill command on cooldown or stuff on cooldown, and then, you know, arcane shots for free whenever you wanted to, essentially. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of going back to it, but right now I'm currently running with Fervor, just because, you know, I can use it between every every pull, and it seems to be fine that way. Yeah, no, I... I... Also was playing around with Thrill of the Hunt a little bit. I currently have Fervor up for the same reason. Basically, after every pull, I can Mm -hmm. jack my focus back to full and keep going. Um, But yeah, I mean, do you guys want to talk about about some stats a little bit? I mean, because now we have most people... I feel like most people are still leveling, but we do have a handful, um, a decent number of people who have hit the level cap, and certainly a lot of them will, will hit it this weekend. Um. And and so we are getting people starting to think about gear, starting to think about um, you know what gear they want, what stats they want, and and the first thing I think is worth worth mentioning because I I did make this post on like hey here's some of the best pre raid gear gear that you can get before raiding, um, and and somebody was like well yeah but you know I just ding ninety what gear should I be getting now to do heroics and and the answer is do heroics and get the gear it drops. <laughs> right, I, I think there's a item level minimum to do heroics, and I I, I, I want to say it's 450, but I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Someone's in the chat room saying it's 440, <clears throat> so you will have to do a little bit of gearing right. up. But, but, but there's to do no heroics. there's there's no optimizing. There's no like, ooh, and I want this and this and that. It's like no, you're going to replace it all in in like every heroic. You're going right. to get something to replace something. Just just do whatever you need to do to get your eye level up. You know, just basically run some five mans, right? Yep. Just one of the normal five mains, like the Moshi Gun Palace, the, the Shadow Pen Monastery. Those are the two higher level ones, like the 87, 88. And just run those, and there's no limit on how many times you can do that and yeah. get the gear from there. Gotcha. Now, if you, if you want to try using the old trick of putting on some PvP gear in order to raise your eye level at the expense of, if it, of its efficiency, there's some things you should know. Uh, first of all, the eye level for PvP gear is actually lower than it would be if it uh, well than it has been relative to the same class uh, yep. in other expansions. And the reason they did this is because the PvP resilience and PvP damage is free. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, it's still going to be ne- probably better than quest uh, rewards. So yeah, I feel um, like. <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like with the PvP gear, they're they're really trying to come up with a solution to make sure you never want PvP gear for raiding and you don't yep. want raid gear to PvP. Which well, well, there is a crossover, though. PvP gear is a perfectly fine way to get into heroics because, like I said, the eye level is lower. It's not going to inflate your ability. And importantly, the eye level reflects the actual stats that you'll be getting from you know the mm-hmm. non-PvP stats. 
which is to say, you know, if you equip a piece of PvP gear that used to be like you had all that wasted itemization on the PvP stats, that's no longer the case. Now, when you equip it, it's a little bit lower than what you can get from, I think, five vans or definitely mm-hmm. lower than heroics, but it's po- probably better than the last green that you got. So it's, it's a pretty except, good way to fill really, in some gaps. Well, except, can you really get to PvP gear faster than PvE gear? Well, that's the thing. Over the next week, people are going to start buying the recipes to, be, to craft it. So the crafted uh, PvP gotcha. blues are going to be... They're not yet easily available. I'm sure some people have them, but you need to max out a character on one of the gear crafting skills, and then you need to max out a reputation or get some reputation. Then you need to use those stupid bond on pickup uh, Spirit of Harmonies and yeah, I was gonna buy say, the recipes. Yeah, we didn't talk about that, the Spirit of Harmonies, and those are just drops, and you can't really farm them very easily. They're random drops. I don't think there's any mob in particular that you can go. Like, so far, I two think bars from 89, and I think I have... Uh, four, <laughs> basically four spirit of harmonies. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I think I think the way you would farm spirit of harmonies, right, is you would try to find an area with a densely mobbed area that you can just grind crap tons of mobs. And right. With AOE looting, it's especially nice. Um, there is one particular <clears throat> place that has not yet been nerfed. If you, I forget what it's called because I'm terrible with names. But if you Google search uh, place to farm spirit of harmony. Uh, maybe add Consortium Storm Spire, because that's where it was posted um, in the Ooh. forums there. Then you'll find that there's one of them where it's, I think, just like the, the highest concentration of mobs with the fastest respawn timer. It's a, it's a flat 1% drop on all care, on all creatures. And as far as I could tell from Wowhead, Wowhead, it's a flat 1% drop on moats from all creatures. Yeah, in the chat sure. room saying... With Literally, the, in the chat room, yeah, yeah, saying that if you get uh, the Tillers faction where you can make your little farm, you can actually plant most of harmony in your farm and grow them that way. Yes, except that uh, you can't get to that until you're level 90, and you... Well, I'm, yes, you're, though, that is correct. That is something that I'm planning on doing, but it's not something you can get right away. Um, and the, I think the, the spirits of harmony that are going to be used to buy the PvP gear are probably going to be generated the hard way. <laughs> hmm. uh, well, this is no, probably not going to be true for more than a couple of weeks. After a couple of weeks, there'll be enough people that have everything that you can just, you know, get whatever you need, but... In the meantime, if you have friends that have crafting professions that are max, leatherworking, tailoring, blacksmithing, um, then uh, you can have them, you know, if they're feeling generous, um, buy the recipe for, that you need, and then they can, you know, make a few and toss them on the auction house. They'll probably find some buyers. Yeah, the that nice thing sense. is that the, the gear itself doesn't take the spirit of harmony. And that's actually one of the weird things about the profession uh, PVE gear is that uh, I, I don't know if this is true for necessarily the entry level rate uh, five man stuff, but the stuff that you can craft for players, like the weapons you can craft as a blacksmith, or uh, I know the armor that you can craft um, that's sort of equivalent to raid level armor. That stuff takes spirits of harmony, so uh, it's uh, there's going to be a lot less crafted gear uh, that's easily available. Interesting. Can you hear me, Yuri? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Can we hear Frost? He hasn't said anything in a while. I don't know. I'm getting a, the, something on Skype saying there's an issue with the call. It looks like he dropped. Uh, okay. <laughs> so maybe it, was just, maybe it was just him. Well, sometimes it's just Skype. Can the, room, can the chat room hear us? <laughs> yeah, the chat room should hear us. The recording is fine. Okay. It's just we lost Frost. Well, no harm, no foul. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I forgot about that. Those spirits of harmony. Like I said, I know it's 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 slow just to get them through questing and leveling. Like I said, I've gotten forty three boats, so which is good for four of those. Yeah. So what bet are you using uh, as BM for leveling? So right now, I've been bouncing around between a couple of different pets. Uh, if there's an area that's got like a lot of water around it, I'll use uh, Water Strider just for the water walking. Hello? I like that. Hey, you're back. Hey, he's back. And then last night we were doing uh, Moshu Gun Palace, and I picked up a Quillen, uh, which is does the crit buff, and it has the battle res. And I actually had to use the battle res during uh, one of the encounters in the Shadow Pan Monastery. So nice. I already had, had the opportunity to res the tank from the dead. It, <laughs> it didn't help us win, but it was kind of <laughs> neat. It was kind of neat to be able to do that, you know? Yeah, for sure. I um, normally don't get too enamored with pets, but uh, my wife's 
I'm not gonna say childhood dog, but the dog, uh, like a 15 year old dog that she's that her that she grew up with, basically, uh, just passed on recently. So I got I got and I, the the first spirit beast that I was trying to get for PvP that I happened to run across was the spectral dog. So or the wolf, I guess. So I uh, uh, she got me to name it after after her dog. So I've been using that one pretty much exclusively. Yeah, and you got Karoma, right? Not versus Skull, which is the other wolf one. Yeah, I got the one in um, Twilight Twilight Highlands. Highlands. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it, was, uh, it didn't seem. I mean, I felt like you walking around. I mean, I checked three spawn li- uh, spawn points, and bang, there was a spirit beast. I'm like, oh, this is what it feels like to be dark brew. Now, watch <laughs> me have trouble finding something something else. Yeah, that's um, funny. And we were sort of talking. And this is a little bit off topic, but with the cross realm, cross zone realms, I don't know yeah. if that makes finding these elites and rares harder. I think it probably did. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. Because now anybody can get them, you know, like it, the spawn timer doesn't change based on the number of people there, like it would for a node of, of ore or something. So now you've got three times to five times as many people who might be willing to, you know, come by and tame it or kill it. Yeah, and they said they were going to adjust some of the spawn timers to account for that, but I don't know if they actually did or not. Um, so I'm not sure what I missed because I Skype was, was down for a couple minutes for me, but are we still on the topic of gearing up and choosing your gear yeah we, we sure we sort of bounced around we sort of talked about those moats of harmony and right. then we had a little bit of discussion of like where's frost and what's wrong with the call <laughs> and, <laughs> can anyone hear us the uh no but i mean so so for gearing up you know just do whatever you need to do to get your eye level to get into heroics which shouldn't be hard once you hit 90 i mean if you're doing some five minutes on the way you'll have some 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 blues and some decent gear but then you know just just run heroics to get the gear you want on the stat front. Um, it's it's agility is still, as always, the number one stat that's better than everything. Um, obviously, you still want the ranged DPS of your weapon. It looks like they're not making ranged weapons with a lot of different speeds. So that's all. I mean, everything I'm seeing is 3.0 uh, on the heroic level. But when you get into secondary stats, obviously, hit and expertise is your top priority. But after that, um, as always, secondary stats are still pretty close together. From what I'm seeing, it looks like for Beast Mastery, all of the secondary stats are incredibly close to each other. They're not as close for the other specs, and across the board, if you're Survival or Marksman, Mastery is your worst stat, and Crit is your best. Hmm. So it's, it's looking like Crit, Haste, Mastery, semicolon, however, comma. If you're BM, they're all just insanely close to each other. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me because BM uh, mastery, you know, pet damage, it strikes me as being sort of, it's got more of a hold on how much we actually do. Like it has a bigger impact. Especially because BM mastery affects a lot of our new talents, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, so, you know, marksman, it's just, you know, random shots and survival. Well, survival is, yeah, but survival doesn't count the few things that aren't, you know, elemental, so. Right, and it's just, you know, mastery for BM is going to affect your blink strike or your links rush um, and, and stuff like that, whereas for the other specs, it's not. So there's literally more buttons that the mastery affects for BM. And so because of that, mastery, I mean, totally, if you want to stack mastery for BM, go for it. If you want to stack crit for BM, go for it. But if you're other specs, it's really kind of crit haste mastery. So I guess then the main thing that that would mean is if you're BM and you don't have a preference over which three you take, uh, that gives you more flexibility in terms of which gear you can take. Uh, if there's something that'll get you a nice round number, exactly the right amount of hit, um, hit or uh, expertise to get exactly capped and not more, then uh, that's always an advantage for BM. Yeah, absolutely. Um, otherwise, so, you know, Otherwise, the gear front, uh, I think gemming looks like it's pretty much the same priority as always. Gem for agility. Now, you had mentioned before the show, um, now that they're giving us twice as much uh, secondary stats as they are primary stats per, per itemization on gemming, uh, is that still the case? Agility is twice as much, if not more? It, uh, it is indeed. For every spec, agility looks like it's more than twice as good as any secondary stat. So, you know, if you have a choice of 120 agility or 320 crit, 120 agility is better. Okay. Um, Fair enough. And what about, um, I mean, this is probably not as relevant until you're at 90 and you've got some decent gear, but uh, for gems and enchants, is there uh, anything, you know, out of the ordinary that we should talk about? Not gems, we already talked about 
like enchants wise i was thinking uh, actually, the one thing people something one other this actually isn't enchant related so go ahead well i was just going to say the one thing a lot of people may not realize is that you won't need reputation for a shoulder enchant you can just buy them off the auction house and um scribes have to make those to level basically yeah i mean certainly the one other thing to consider in gearing is the fact that you you can get valor points now from doing daily quests Oh yeah, you can you can yeah. get valor points. This is Blizzard's whole goal of to let you get the gear you want playing the way you want. So if you want to just hang out and do dailies and and do your crafting and play with your pet battles, that's great. You'll eventually get your valor points up too, and you can purchase valor point gear from if you have. It usually requires revered with all of the factions. So if you're revered with Shadowpan, there's a bunch of awesome valor point gear you can get. If you're revered with, you know, whatever, Golden Lotus, there's Valor Point gear you can get. And so it is absolutely worth, if you if you are talking about getting geared and doing your whole pre-raid gearing and stuff, it is absolutely worth doing those dailies for the Valor Points. Um, and my recommendation is really to do, do your heroic grinds, although that might be an easy way to, if you can get like the 1250 for the minimum one, that might be a good way to boost your eye level. But my recommendation is mostly to do your heroic grind and get what gear you can get, and then whatever gear you're unluck, whatever slot you're unlucky on, like, oh man, no matter what I do, I don't get any boots. Okay, I'm going to go buy, spend my valor points on boots then. You kind of use it to fill in the slots that you're not getting your heroic drops from. Yeah. And right now, too, I mean, once you hit level 89, you should be able to go and do the Brewfest boss, and I can't imagine that he's that difficult. Yeah. You know, those yeah, are generally pretty easy, so that's another source of uh, Yeah, the gear. Brewfest boss has a, uh, a heroic trinket that doesn't make the best two or three list. It's not great, but, you know, it's certainly better than a non-heroic item for that slot. <laughs> However, the, um, the Headless Horseman does drop a really, really good um, item for Hunters. I don't remember off the top of my head what it was. But so with Hollow's End coming up, that is going to give something that's um, totally competitive for your your, your pre-raid gear set. How uh, how long is Brewfest on for? Just a week? No, I want to say it's like till the, almost the middle of October. At least a couple weeks. I'll say October 13th, maybe. Okay. And then uh, is there any overlap <laughs> with uh, Hallow's Eve or whatever? Hallow's End? I have no idea. I don't yeah, I'm know. I'm not sure. All right, I'm sure well, the, I'll check my in-game calendar. Knows. <laughs> well, it's fine. Just check your in-game calendar and plan accordingly. I mean, I Hallow's End is another one that's at least usually at least a couple weeks long, and I think it ends on or after Halloween. So, Oh, someone said it starts yeah. three days later. Okay. And, so, and, and the, nice, the nice thing, particularly about this Hallow's End drop, that's you know totally your pre-rate. This is the only time that you will want this piece of gear. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's true, because, you know, next year, it'll be so, it'll be old and outdated. Yeah, and even if they update it, you always get, you always already have better. So this is the one time that you'll be like, sweet, I totally want to fight the Headless Horseman and get this drop, and and that'll be gear that I'm going to use going into my raids. It'll be awesome. <laughs> so so definitely awesome. hit up Hallow's End this year, even if you, like me, normally ignore anything except for fest. Now, is there a the cap on the Valor? Was it like a 1,000 per week? Is that what we're at? I want to say, or is there a I don't know. That? I don't know what... I'm sure there's a cap. I don't know what it is. I don't know how much you can actually get from dailies versus heroics. I And I actually poked around and actually talked to some people at WoW Insider, and they went, no, no, we don't actually have any kind of roundup of that. You can write it if you want. I'm like, no, I just want to know. <laughs> I seem to remember hearing that, uh, and I forget whether this is uh, your second character per week that you gain valor on. I, you either get it twice as fast, or you can only get half as much. I forget which one it was, or both. You, I think you get 50% more. Actually, somebody in the chat room mentioned this recently. Somebody said, once you get your week's max, mm -hmm. once you get the maximum valor points for your week, your alts get a buff that give 50% more valor. Okay, that was it. That was it. So yeah, I just can't remember what the weekly cap is. I knew there was a, a cap for the week, and like I said, I remember the buff, but I just can't remember what it, what it was. Mm. Fair enough. Well, let's see. Mists of what people have to say. Pandaria. Oh, you you got to mute your mic. That sounds so loud. Our <laughs> weekly cap. Um, so, 
joystick. Let me Google that for you. Dot com. <laughs> now, someone said 4K is the weekly cap. Oh wow! Wow, that that's seemed, high. That seems very high. I thought that was maybe just, an overall just you know, cap. The, the expensive Valor items are like twenty two fifty, and the cheap ones are yeah. twelve fifty. The middle ones are like seventeen fifty. Fair enough. So um, we should probably talk about. Um, we should probably talk about for the rest of. Um, is there anything here that we had on the agenda for uh, before we go to the listener Q and A or to the listener emails? I think we had one Q and A so far. So um, yeah, I don't know. The other thing we didn't—I know you didn't mention it in your article, and you it, intentionally so. But don't forget, you know, depending on what profession you have, you have engineering or jewel crafting. You're going to be able to make some gear items from there potentially too to to help right. you as far as your pre- absolutely. Game. That's a good point. Yep. Yeah, I guess we're just at the stage now where it's going to be that uh, most people are still in the middle of that long slog to 90, and uh, we'll see how that goes. We'll probably have a lot more to say once we've all started rating. As far as I can tell, it looks like Valor Points have a weekly cap of 1,000, and you can only hold 3,000. Okay. Yeah, nine so, so that means that uh, you need, this is what MMO Champion says, and that means that uh, you, you, you need more than weeks worth of valor grinding to get even the cheapest item yeah that's what i thought and w- um this is a probably unknowable yet but has there been any talk about comparing now that we have you know, a live level 90 hunter um you know about where we stand in terms of dps because i mean on beta we were one of the at least beta for pvp we were <clears throat> sort of in the top three in terms of the amount of uh, pressure or damage we could put out in a short period of time um, how is that holding through for PVE? Have we have we honestly, seen? A- honestly, we're not going to know for sure until raids are going for a while, because uh, in in beta there was all of these simulation craft numbers showing that hunters were on the bottom, but Blizzard quickly stepped in and went, "That is not what we're seeing," and they're like, "We're we're trying to help out, but it's we really can't spend our time to debug simulation craft for you," <laughs> um, and. And in the people who were raiding on beta, Hunter's DPS was looking good. And Blizzard said that the you know your patchwork target dummy DPS numbers um, were like their goal. They said most of them were within two percent of each other, and some of them were only within five percent, which is really obviously that's all on target dummy. So, but we won't know for sure until we start seeing raids and getting data from that. Um, you know, we still have I know the SimCraft people are constantly in, improving. Um, the results from that, but until we actually see raids, because I mean, one thing that's worth pointing out is, even if every class does exactly the same potential DPS on a target dummy fight, if every single fight out there, you know, favors ranged classes and hurts melee classes, okay, well, that's still an unbalanced situation. Yeah. So yeah. some of it also depends on what actual boss mechanics we have to come up against. Yeah, fair enough. And when are they going to, if we, uh, once we do hit level 90, aside from waiting for everybody else that we're going to be raiding with the lit hit level 90, I remember hearing something about, they said they weren't going to release, and it might have been Heroics for a couple of weeks, but they're, are they releasing the regular raids immediately? Uh, I thought it was like one week before they released the raid, and I think they're looking for raid. The raid finder was going to be like a week after the normal raids or some, something along those lines. They're going to have some sort of staggered approach to these raids. They weren't going to even okay. release all the raids available in the first tier at the same time. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I, I really like the staggered release for raids. Yeah, well, it means it takes the pressure off the people who just who don't have day and night to just, you know, play the game, but I'm I sure it kind of annoys... Li- I think it makes it, life a little easier on also the front-end raiding guilds, right? So they're not, they don't absolutely have to be like, okay, everybody needs to be level 90 in one day. The second day, you have to be totally geared up, and the third day, we raid. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of uh, high-end rating guilds, obviously we, I think we may have talked about this before, but we've, I'm sure a lot of people know that uh, a couple of high-profile rating guilds have gone down to 10-mans. Which is really um, interesting. Yes, yes. Have you, do you guys have any, uh, I mean, I, don't, well, I, I know that there's been a lot of people in the community in the past that have said if it's not 25, it doesn't count, but that was back before they changed the uh, the rules for loot. Um 
do you think that the ten uh, progression progression guilds are going to have any uh, any advantage at all in, in getting world first raid kills or whatever? I don't think so. I mean, I I think I, I have a feeling they might regret it um, because Ghostcrawler has you know come out and said you know what ten mans require more personal responsibility, twenty five mans require way more organization and he said and you know what the way more organization makes it harder to get a 25 man happening he's like i don't think we're doing a good job of rewarding them sufficiently and so to me this is you know a kind of a fed chair-esque <laughs> indication that we're probably going to see somehow them doing something to reward the extra organizational effort of a 25 man more and you know, okay. historic, you know, in Cataclysm, there were raids that were easier on twenty-five, and there were bosses that were easier on ten. I don't think that's the issue, but I mean, it's. I just, it's I never been on an individual encounter basis. It's always been on an operational basis. Yeah, and I think the other thing too, for a lot of the reason why people want to do ten, is it's easier to find ten consistently good players than it is to find twenty-five. <laughs> I mean, we've even experienced that to some degree in our own guild, where, I mean. Most progression we've had happens in our tens and not our twenty uh, fives necessarily. Yeah, and that part of that is to be fair because because we have a twenty five, we can stack four legendaries in our DPS core <coughs> in our ten. Um, but that's not something that uh, is part of the design of ten. The other thing is that the people that go to the tens are just extremely skilled, and they do most of the work in the twenty five too. It's just a much bigger problem, so you have a lot more other people with uh, you know contributing. But you know. They are the ones who, you know, like, I'll, I'll name names, like Roven, for example, is consistently number one on DPS. If there's ever an opportunity for a rogue to be number one on DPS, he'll do it. And, uh, you know, he'll do as much as two other pl- any two other players, basically. You know, and that's that's the kind of thing that, you know, when you're in it, no matter what level you play at, no matter whether you're a world competitive guild or whether you're just sort of a small social guild that happens to raid, um, 25 bands... Uh, you're going to have that problem of finding and retaining good players. And the other thing is that it's better for an individual player to go to a, 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 a individual good player. It's better for them to find a spot in a tent filled with other good players than it is for mm-hmm. them to go through the extra effort of trying to, you know, <clears throat> do a 25 and, you know, hope that enough people that are good show up this week kind of thing. Yeah, although you, you have to think that the assumption is always that when you get to the, you know, the Paragon level guilds, that they really have. 25 people that are playing at the top of their game. They well, the, assu- the assumption is that they will have the best 25 people uh, in the world available at all <laughs> times to them. And what, you know, the, the quality of who that is depends on how how interesting the game is and how many people are interested in you know long you know long <laughs> large investments of time in a game. But uh, you know that is the assumption that they are going to have their pick of people. Um, but uh, that said. If it was an advantage at any point in the past for one of those guys to get world first kills in ten man, it would have been. Done. And um, as far as I know, I don't even think. Uh, now, now that I've said that, I'm starting to think I remember hearing something about stars, the Chinese uh, guild doing ten mans. But, anyways, I don't think there's been like a huge crisis of of you know twenty five versus ten. You know, do they count it or not? Kind of in in the in the <coughs> blogosphere about uh, world first guilds. So. I suspect that it really just is easier to get a world first with the 25 man than it is with the 10. Possibly for those guys, you know, especially the, you know when they go in there under geared, <coughs> I, I would imagine having 25 people gives them a lot of flexibility there, a lot more utility than they otherwise would have in a 10. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and you know the but the 10 man does particularly like if you're a paragon and you're running a 10 man. You suddenly have, I mean, if you're trying to do world competitive um, rating, you also have a lot more ability to swap characters, probably, right? Like, oh, hey, this particular encounter would benefit from having a party of 10 rogues. Okay, we can do that. <laughs> well, not quite that bad, but let's say, you know, if you have a situation where. You know, this encounter would be easier if we were to if we were to make sure that we had a minimum of like you know four mages. You know, at that point they have enough DPS slots that they can do that. But yeah, um, I understand what you mean. Well, all right, let's see, we got fifteen minutes left. We want to go to the Q and A. Oh, we have one Q. Yeah, that's. 
Um, all right. Well, our one listener question comes from Gentle Marty, who says, uh, did Blizzard ever say anything about if and when they may increase the stable size again? Because, honestly, with all the new pets and their abilities, we might fill our current slots just to be covering raid buffs. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the answer is kind of no and no. Um, I haven't seen anything indicating that they're, they're they're boosting stable slots. You know, they went from three to five, and then they went from five to twenty-five, and now they haven't said anything about increasing it. It is worth noting: you need fewer pets to cover all the buffs now than you did in Cataclysm. You sure, certainly do. I was going to say uh, there's fewer buffs, and you don't need quite as many. But still, <laughs> we I think we need more stable slots. I, I'm trying to find it. Ghostcrawler did mention. Something about that not too long ago. Oh, really? Uh, well, I remember when they. Yeah, well, well, out. he didn't say he was that they were going to increase stable slots, but he sort of tried to answer the question about. Um, so yeah, this was when he established his Twitter account. He said, you know, more stable slots would be fine to a point. Don't want hunters feeling like they should tame every pet they see. And that oh, was, I do remember reading that. And he said, Tame, it should be a decision. There are plenty of collect-all achievements. Hunters aren't crazy cat-hoarding ladies. So that's what <laughs> Ghost Crawler said about that. So, well, some but, of us are, clearly. <laughs> well, but no, there is a point, though, that, uh, I mean, a lot of, I mean, every hunter kind of has their, like, handful of, like, ooh, I really like this pet. I have some kind of sentimental attachment. But on top of that, there's a lot of hunters that any kind of rare pet they want to collect. And right now, the rare pets are the Tame Challenges, in the Spirit Beast, there's so many of them that if you really are a rare pet collector, you can probably fill your your stable with that. Yeah, I think that's the the what's what's filling up people's stable slots. It's, it's like those yeah, Spirit Beasts. There's are... nine Spirit Beasts in the game, and like I have all nine on on Dark Brew. And if they weren't so hard to get, I would probably be tempted to dump a few because to dump a couple <laughs> of them because I'll never use them. I don't. They're just there sitting in the stable. Right, and we and we I know we're collect- getting. Yeah, and we're getting more spirit beasts with the mm-hmm. next the next major patch, and there's all of the the rare pets that you have to track in mists, um, and then now, there's the tame challenges from um, from cataclysm. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you could I think you could fill twenty five just with the rare stuff. Now that's there's two things I was going to say. First of all, for the people who are having trouble with the amount of table the stable slots that they have because they're into all these uh, challenges and stuff. You might want to adopt a bit of a catch and release program, not unlike sports fishing, where uh, you know every time you catch a new pet, um, you go back to the the, the oldest or le- you know most common or least hard or you know, whatever pet that you have in your stables. You know, take a couple of screenshots with it, make sure it's it's there so you can show it to your kids when they go to older, and then release <laughs> it. But I mean, the 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 point is, it's not. I mean, unless it's a pet that you're getting active use out of, uh, you might want to. That might be one way that you can get around this whole stable limitation. Because if you think of it, it's nice to be able to pull it out in the city. But if you're not actually using it for anything other than pulling it out in the city, well, you you can get almost the same thing just by having a, a uh, or not almost the same thing. But I, I mean, like when when it comes down to this, the hard decision of you know, if I want this really really attractive pet, um, I have to get I have to make room somewhere. Which one do I get rid of? I'm just. Um, I'm just picturing, like, you know, being a grandpappy and showing your kids a slideshow <laughs> on the projector. Like, all right, now, this, this guy here, this was an odd six, an odd six broken tooth at a 1.0 attack speed. And this guy, here... This, this, this wolf <clears throat> used to be a worgen. <laughs> um uh, yeah, that, that's one thing. The other thing I would say is that, uh, well, first of all, how many pets, was it eight pets you need to cover all the debuffs and buffs? I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, one thing about that is, you know, if you start running with a regular group of people, eventually you're going to find which buffs you have regularly and some and which ones you don't. And you may not need to have all, every raid buff, yeah. debuff in your arsenal. Exactly. So, and another one is if, if you happen to have a couple of, uh, if you're almost always bringing the same pet, that's fine. If you if you almost never have to bring a specific other pet, and it's not wasn't one of those rare taming challenges or something, um, you know, there's you might be able to to just sort of get away with you know getting rid of that pet uh, if it's a common one that you just picked up expressly for the buff and no other reason, and then just uh, <clears throat> you know reacquiring it if you ever need to change for the night. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good point. But certainly, I, I, I do appreciate the fact that they make these rare pets that are hard to find makes a certain, a certain percentage of the hunter population feel like, ooh, that's a challenge that I want to accomplish, and God damn it! I want to be able to keep the rare pet. I want void mm-hmm. storage for my pets. Give me long-term pet storage. You know, let me oh, board that somewhere. Yeah. Is there any limitation on void storage? I think you can just keep adding to it, right? Uh, I didn't think so. I, I thought there was a limit to how much you can have. I thought it was unlimited, but I mean that would actually be an interesting idea: vo- void storage for pets, because you know at that point they could make it still a you know they could avoid the whole problem of people taming you know 150 cats by um well i'm sure that's not what, that's not the actual problem this is the, the <laughs> example that he used but you know they could make it a real choice if every time you wanted to go over 25 pets you had to put it into void storage it wouldn't be available on the trainer maybe there'd be a 24 hour cooldown on getting to your void storage and they could make it cost you know 100 and then 1000 and then 10000 then then 100000 gold to keep it or you know some progression to keep on you know adding to your void storage so that you know you essentially have the ability to store all of the challenge uh, tames, but it's going to cost you, kind of thing. Or even, except, or and, even just use the current void storage costs, right? You know, it, it, you, you know whatever you it is, put them in, yeah. take them out, cost you gold. So there's a limitation there, um, and yeah, and ideally set it up in a way that it's still, it's not like you can. Certainly, don't want a situation where someone is motivated to tame every skin in the game. Um, but certainly, yeah. I think it's reasonable for Hunter to say, "Hey, I want to cover all the raid buffs." And I want to collect every rare pet and and pet challenge that you give me. Uh, I think that's probably a reasonable request. Yeah, I'd have your own private menagerie or cryogenic deep freeze pet storage. <laughs> maybe maybe engineers can build it. That yeah okay. <laughs> I was thinking enchanters. Like I don't know if you've ever seen the movie or read the book, but in one of the Harry Potter's, there was this. Um, chest that uh, it was like bottomless or something and it was just some guy that that was stuck in there for a long time he was just sort of living there and unhappily going crazy I don't know I like the idea of like an engineering like injection like a cryogenic storage injection that turns a pet into an item and then you can just (laughs) put it in void storage actually there would be some precedent there with the mini pets yeah you you turn them into an item now he's an item, takes up a bag slot, you can put him in void storage, and anytime yeah. you want to, you can click on him to to reheat him, right? <laughs> this this has a perverse sort of logic to it. I I, I, I could kind of uh, I could kind of get behind this. That's right. Shrink them down to size so they fit in a storage container and then have like a mini microwave to thaw them out. Uh, or instead of um, you know, the whole engineering concept, they could use that um, the the jade statue motif that they had in one mm. of the starter zones where they had this witch turning uh, anybody who walked into her yard into a jade statue so that could be yeah. another motif yeah interesting okay well we'll, we'll see you guys Anyways. are getting nowhere near my cats thank you very much <laughs> 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 yeah well you know i suppose if they ever did do that i would make a point of of you know taming 100 cats from Azrami style just because I could take a screenshot and use that as a the the, the one time in a blue moon that they make me write uh, scattered shots typically for PvP, I would use that as my screenshot. And, Is you know. a shot of void storage <laughs> filled with pets? Cats. Just cats. Well, my hunch is, I mean, <laughs> realistically, the way to do it is they would ha- there would have to be some new code that you can turn a pet into an item. But then they would probably just all have the same icon, right? Well, no, I was a ma- uh, maybe uh, the the mini pets have unique icons, or if not unique, pretty close, like maybe one for each family or something. Yeah, I mean the pet families already have their own icons. I mean, you know, cats yeah. have their own icon, spirit beasts, etc. Yeah, so they could just do it that way. Yeah. So, uh, did we have any uh, any follow up questions to this, or any email? Any emails? There was no emails this week. Um, oh, just back everybody to everybody was busy this week for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> But oh, you you had talked about like the raid release schedule. I was just looking that up. So next week, October second, the first raid Moshugan Vaults opens up normal mode, and then on October seventh, the LFR version, and then anyone who happens to clear normal can do heroic on the seventh of October, and then at the end of the month, October thirtieth, 
the Heart of Fear and Terrace of Endless Springs normal dungeons uh, open. And I think they said Terrace will only be accessible by clearing the Heart of Fear. So you're going to have to clear one before doing the other. And then oh. on November 6th, they'll do the LFR versions. I like this. This That's a good progression. You know, I, I've i always felt that they should go back to the mode of, maybe not through an entire expansion, like it was an extreme in, in BC, but go back to the mode where everybody who wants to start raiding starts at a specific place, mm-hmm. and they have to work their way up to the pinnacle of raiding for the that difficulty level of, at, at that time. You know, in, in Vanilla, this led to problems where you had, you know, revolving door guilds that could never get out of that rut of, we are the guild that can only clear the first tier. Right. Um, and in BC, you had similar ruts where you had people skipping, you know, I skipped uh, tier 5, it went tier 4 to straight to tier 6. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that they swung too far in the other direction for the last two expansions. Because in, in Wrath and in Cataclysm, it was really like you you just did not need to ever see the content that wasn't that had not been released less than you know six months ago. I don't know. I, I think this might be a good way of doing it, where it's like you can still skip tiers, but each tier has a progression to it, right? Yeah, I suppose there's something to that. I, I personally would like to make it so that there is some advantage to going back and seeing seeing content that was not built recently, because they keep on building all this all these new tiers for us and all this new content, and we keep paying for it and playing it. But you know, there is a lot of stored up value that you know I see people going and doing just because. Yeah, but well, just because it's not a good enough answer when well, you only have a few hours a week. Yeah, it's not just because, yeah, transmog and then going back and doing the achievements and trying to get those mounts. I mean, that's a lot of people spend a lot of time, especially at the end of Cataclysm, going back and doing Ulduar and eating even some of the earlier Cata stuff. I mean, that's what they were doing. They were doing achievements, trying to get those mounts and and, and transmog gear. You just named my laundry list of things that I never allowed to. Uh, I've decided I will never allow to let and them to influence my actions as achievements, mounts, <laughs> mini pets, <laughs> transmog. I mean, these things have no bearing on, you know, what I consider the the core of the game, which is you know PVE or PvP. I think that there should be some sort of actual advantage. Let's say, you know, some. Uh, obviously, if you if it's so old that you can solo it, then maybe not. But it, maybe they could come up with some way of because I remember I don't know if you guys uh, saw this, but there was a post either on a water cooler or Twitter or something where they were saying um, they might consider reopening like 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 scaling down stats on gear so that you could so they could go and make challenge mode versions of earlier tiers worth of content. Of yeah, I saw that. Or, or so, yeah, being able to go back and run Karazhan as if you were a level seventy, and with the exactly, content. yeah, that would I be. Pretty, if they could, if, if they could make that work, if they could make it a challenge, uh, no matter what you know what the input is, if they could make it so that you walk into that thing with no advantage given to you by your gear, a very minimal difference given to you by by your gear, and make some sort of actual reward for that that was relevant in some other way than you know, oh, you can change the color of your pixels. You know, sure. then no, I mean, that I would think, I think, I think that would be an enormous amount of work because this, this, this started coming up back in BC days, the idea of like people who our guild doesn't level beyond 60 and we're going to be a vanilla guild and we're going to do all of the stuff that vanilla guilds did, except even if you're just using gear with those stats, they're still so much tougher because just the way the mechanics change. So it's literally, in addition to the scaling, all of the bosses and stuff need to be retuned to account for all the new abilities that everybody has. True, but they could just go through and uh, you know cherry pick the uh, the content that would be you know viable through the system without any uh, huge yeah. amounts of work. And well, the other thing uh, is that the amount of work required to make this happen would be much less than the amount of work that they had to initially build what that encounter at that, that, that time. Um, and what they're doing true. is they're unlocking it. Like, I started in BC. I've never seen any of the uh, vanilla bosses, except for the ones that were reused in Max. You know, they could basically buy themselves a huge amount of new content for me to consume and the people like me to consume just by making it a challenge again and putting a reward in front of it. And, yeah, well, they, could, it and they could certainly hit some of the, like, all-time favorites, which is like mm-hmm. Arizona and Ulduar, right? Those yeah. would be the top of the list of, like, these ones, everybody... And, and you're right in the sense, like, all of the art is done. Right? It's, it's all not mechanical. just art, though. 
Well, uh, I mean, the one thing they did say, though, is if they were trying, let's say they wanted to make Karazhan level 90. They wanted to make it level 90. They, they said that's actually a lot of work for them to do, to retune it to that level. And, and it's almost to the point where it's easier for them to design a new, brand new encounter for us to experience okay. than it would be to, 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 and that's just raising the level and retuning those. Now, I don't know. Now, what you're talking about before is, you know, bumping us back down to, say, level 70 <laughs> yeah, and experiencing the content the way it is. And maybe that would be less work for them. But, again, but what would the rewards be? Yeah. yeah. But I imagine this retuning would be less than the initial investment that they made in designing that place, you know, putting together all the walls and, you know, right. drawing the bosses and all that stuff. And, and so what I'm saying is that they could – it wouldn't be completely new, but you know, if if at the end of uh, you know, what? Ooh, I got an idea. You know how they always have the the loot pool bosses, right? The Tolbrad, um, yeah. Where like, yeah, these bosses just draw from this. What if you just had this big pool that you can always get from Ulduar or Karazhan or <laughs> Blackwing's Lair or what have you? Yeah, that'd and be a so, great idea. So it's, it's one big pool of loot. You do whatever you want to do, but you can go back to the one of your choice. Because you're right, because they've talked before about, you know, Ghost Crawlers talked before about the time cost of art and how it's really, really high. And that's all done. I mean, it, it is laid out. They have a basic idea of what the mechanics are. They, even if they scale you down to 70, they still probably have to rework all of the, the mechanical stuff from scratch. But but they know what the mechanics will be. They just have to rework all the math, right? Mm-hmm. That's a good idea. And the, the whole idea of a pool of loot, um, I'm not sure that that would scale perfectly because then they would have to make sure that for anything eligible to give you loot out of that pool, it has to all be within the same realm of difficulty. Um, but, you know, even if that's not the case, they could take the stuff that, let's say for some reason, after they do their retuning, um, it's much, much harder to get Alduar than it is to get Karazhan, and they're both rewarding the same loot. Well, they could give Alduar some sort of a, um, reward that doesn't matter to people like me, that does matter to everybody else and that they're currently doing it for, which is achievements and, you know, um, well, transmog and yeah. whatever, you know. I, mean, I think there's some stuff. precedent for that, too. I think when they redid Anixia and brought it back at... Uh Level eighty. I mean, and that was. I think that was still pretty popular. People used to run that every week, and when it had rewards and things to offer, and I think people enjoyed that. Yeah. yeah, it was a nice short encounter, and it was a blast from the past from other people. We could all make jokes about many whelps, and <laughs> yeah, you know. And I think I, I, I like the loot pool idea. I mean, it really just comes down to what kind of manpower it takes for them to retune these. And keep it in mind, they'll have to kind of regular. They'll have to retune them every expansion, right? No, well, it depends. That's if they bring them up to ninety, then they would. But if they instead of bringing them up to ninety, bring us down to whatever we would need to be to make it fair, they still and then have base to base it on around that. They still have to retune them because we have all these new abilities that changes the the scope of a yeah. raid, raid encounter. I mean, it's yeah, kind of well, like it's like if you bring us down to sixty and throw us in Blackwing's Lair. Well, hey, guess what? There's a whole bunch of bosses that back in Vanilla that were just immune to fire damage. <laughs> that doesn't really work right now with the way the game is. I keep on forgetting about how stupid this game was before I played it. Um, <laughs> and not to mention the fact that the mechanics were designed around the fact that you need resist gear. Yeah. Okay, well, so you, you, you still have to retune it based on how the game changes. Yeah, I, I understand it's, what you're saying. But, but I, I like the idea of, you know, cherry pick a few that were like exceptionally exceptionally well done and well loved Probably both, which is more important Entourage is a good example I've never been in there and I, I know a lot of people like it in there in where? Encourage AQ right 20 or 40 I don't know I've never tried them oh. um, but yeah I mean take the ones that, 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 that people really really liked and that were really really good and you know find a way to justify investing the time because you know that I mean, I think that is, particularly if you could come up with, I like the loot pool idea that, you know, it's like the Argoloth, it's it's PvP, it's PvE, it's everything. I like the really big loot pool idea, but then also, you know, go ahead and toss in, like, hey, we're also going to invest some time to put up a handful of mounts and achievements and all of these. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. At, and at the risk of sounding completely stupid, did they, they didn't do a Toll Barat or Wintergrass this time around, did they, for Pandaria? There's no... it, they did world bosses. That's right, the world bosses. Yeah, they have world yeah. bosses that have that loot pool now, I believe. 
Um, however, I need to take off. We're over on time. We are over on time, so let's uh, let's go ahead and do our, uh, our our wrap up here. This has been episode 146, I think, of the Hunting Party Podcast. Uh, this is Euripides from OTPS, Wow Insider, and the Call to Auction Podcast. And I'm Dark Brew from thebrewhall.com and the Brew Hall on Twitter. And this is Frost Time from Warcraft Hunters Union, Wow Insider, and Frost Time WHU on Twitter. Ali is probably on mute again, but that's Ali Sonder from the Hunting Party Podcast. Uh, we are on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and if you don't use any of that, we have RSS on the uh, show notes. And if you like us, please don't be shy about leaving us a review on iTunes, especially one where you mention how uncommonly good-looking Frost Time is. If you want to try naming this show, you can email us at the Hunting Party Podcast at gmail dot com. Sorry, at Hunting Party Podcast at gmail dot com, and uh, we'll get your name professionally mangled on air. All right, stay thirsty, my friends. Remember to drink your dark brew lager. Don't forget Grr. the spear and do- <laughs> Don't forget the spear and your failed druid. Grr. And don't forget <laughs> to pay your dues. A uh, couple notes um, at the very end. Uh, for those who joined us late, uh, BRK had a uh, real life issues come up, wasn't able to make it, but he said he is going to be able to make it next week. Semicolon, however, comma, I am not going to be able to make it next week. I'm going to be uh, off camping for the gaming camping trip at the end of the year. And I did tweet at Ghostcrawler the idea of cryogenically freezing pets into items to put in void storage. So we'll see if he responds to that. I Actually, Warvin had know. a suggestion. He was going to steal it from Spotor. Put them in carbonite. <laughs> oh, yeah. carbonite! Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. A little paw sticking up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love you. Oof. (laughs) 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 I just got that reference.